This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. A hadith of Imam An Nawawi rahimahullah. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala tonight, our fourth installment, our fourth lesson, insha'Allah. We went through, alhamdulillah, the biography of this great Imam, this Imam An Nawawi, rahimahullah. We discussed his biography, spoke about his youth, spoke about the various books that he had authored, alhamdulillah. We then moved on our discussion to the muqaddima, the introduction to this book, the Forty Ahadith. Who's written the muqaddima? Who's written the introduction? None other than Imam An Nawawi himself, alhamdulillah. He mentions why he put together these ahadith. He mentioned his aim and objective behind the collection of these ahadith. Alhamdulillah. We also discussed the mas'ala of the usage of weak ahadith. Whether one's allowed to use weak ahadith in ahkam, in law, in jurisprudence. We also discussed the mas'ala of using weak ahadith in fadail, in virtuous acts. And what, is, what are the opinions of the scholars on that matter? We saw majority of the ulama allowed the usage of weak ahadith in fadail with conditions. Super important, with conditions. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amatullah. We then moved on to the explanations authored by ulama past and present on these 40 ahadith. Walhamdulillah. We discussed the book in great detail. We spoke about its original name, Al Arba'in fi Mabani Al Islam wa Qawaid Al Ahkam. 42 ahadith, but why is the book called the 40 ahadith of Imam al Nawawi? We discussed. We also touched upon the content of these ahadith, the authenticity of these ahadith, other collections by other scholars with regards to 40 ahadith. 40 ahadith with regards to giving sadaqah. 40 ahadith with regards to akhlaq. 40 ahadith with regards to marriage, and many others. Walhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. We then moved on our discussion to the first ahadith, subhanallah. And that was in our previous majlis. Our previous majlis, we began with hadith number one. And this hadith, subhanallah, super, super important. As Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, that great scholar, he said, if anyone wants to author a book, put this hadith as the first hadith in your book why remind the reader of why is he reading the book remind the author why are you authoring this book subhanallah the matter of intention the matter of niyyah ya abdullah ya amat allah we went through the hadith an amir al mu'minin an amir al mu'minin abi hafs umar ibn al khattab umar radiyallahu ta'ala an that giant he narrates from who from the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam did he hear from somebody who heard from another no he said sami'tu i heard from the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam what did he hear inma al a'mal bin niyat verily actions are according to are in accordance to your intention. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are but by intention. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِ مَّا نَوَى And everyone shall have what they intended. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ Whoever migrates, makes the hijra إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ To Allah and the Rasul وسلم, Then his hijra is to Allah and the Rasul. As for, وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا Whoever migrated for dunya, for a better job, to get married to somebody, for something, whatever, studies, whatever it might be. أَوْ إِمْرَأَةِ يَنْكِحُهَا Or to get married to a woman. فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجْرَ إِلَيْهِ Then his hijra is for whatever he migrated for. Who narrated this hadith? Which books would we find this hadith found in? Subhanallah, we discussed the takhreej of this hadith. Plus minus 90 books of a hadith you will find. You will find this hadith. The famous six books of a hadith. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, An Nasai, Ibn Majah. It's there. There's only one issue. What's the issue? Why is it not found in the collection of Imam Malik? The muwatta of Imam Malik. Strange. Imam Malik is one of the individuals in the chain of this hadith. How come he has not put it in his book? We say, subhanallah. There are various renditions of the muwatta of Imam Malik. 
And the famous one, yes, it does not have this hadith in it. But the other version of the Muwatta, and that's the Muwatta of Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani, we do find this hadith in it, walhamdulillah. We moved our discussion in our previous majlis to the chain of narration of this hadith. Umar narrates, who narrates from him? Alqama ibn Waqas al-Layfi. From him, Muhammad ibn, ibn, ibn Ibrahim al-Taymi. From him, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari. And from him, over 200. We picked out the peculiar matters related to the Sanad. And subhanallah, some might say, you know, this matter of the chain of narration and Salim narrated and Ahmed heard from him and then Ahmed narrated it to somebody else by the name of Ilyas. This is something very, very boring, subhanAllah. This is something too academic for me. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. If the least you get out of this super, super, super tiny discussion is appreciation for the science, appreciation for those scholars who spent their lives studying the lives of others to know whether they met, to know whether they were truthful, to know whether they were members of this sect or that sect or whatever sect it might be. Because sometimes, subhanAllah, an individual might be coming from a certain ideological background and if he narrates something which is suspect in aid of that ideological background then we have an issue with that hadith there's something suspect with regards to that hadith Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, we learned that this hadith was gharib fi awwalihi, mashhoor fi akhirihi, that there's solitary narrators at the beginning of this chain. But then over 200 and from them hundreds and hundreds narrate this hadith. That's something peculiar, something strange, something unusual. Subhanallah. We also saw from Umar, three of those individuals, they were from the tabi'een, they were from the followers of the sahaba. Walhamdulillah. Imam al-Bukhari mentions this hadith six times in his Sahih al-Bukhari. He begins Sahih al-Bukhari with this hadith subhanallah and he also ends it off with a hadith which was Gharib, the giant. Who is the giant? The giant Umar ibn al-Khattab. We discussed his biography, walhamdulillah. We discussed when was he born, when did he pass away, how did he die? Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. Any individual who enters a place of worship, enters for example a masjid and he blows himself up, enters a masjid and takes the life of another in a masjid, he is following the sunnah of who? He is following the sunnah of who? He is following the sunnah of Abu Lu'luwa al-Majusi, Abu Lu'luwa the fire worshipper, the one who entered the masjid when Amirul Mu'mineen was performing Salatul Fajr, when our master Umar ibn al-Khattab was leading the Salah in Masjid al-Nabawi, Abu Lu'luwa enters. He comes with his dagger. It's dark in the masjid. They did not have electricity, no fancy lights like we have today. What did he do? He comes forward and he stabs Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an. Allahu musta'an. Allah Musta'an. And then in the in the ensuing fight, he stabs about thirteen others, and in total six or seven lose their lives. And then the criminal, the mujrim, he takes his own life. He stabs himself, he kills himself. Allah Musta'an. Whoever follows in that, you enter masjid and you and you take the life of another, you are following this criminal. You are following the sunnah of this criminal, Abu Lu'luwa al-Majusi. Brothers and sisters, we discussed the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He was called Al-Faruq, and he was also called Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for him. What dua? Oh Allah, guide one of the two who's more beloved to you, either Umar ibn al-Khattab or... Or oh, Abu Jahl, subhanAllah. People used to call that man Abu Al-Hakam, the father of wisdom. But because his wisdom did not bring him to Al-Islam, the Muslims called him Abu Jahl, Allah Musta'an. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, we discussed his agreement with the Qur'an in many instances. He said, Ya Rasulullah, something. Ya Rasulullah, something. And subhanAllah, revelation came down in accordance to his opinion. For example, the matter of hijab, Ya Rasulullah, your wives are not like any other woman out there. They should be covered up. The verses of hijab came down. Do not pray over the munafiqeen, Ya Rasulullah. This Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, head of the munafiqeen, head of the hypocrites, Ya Rasulullah. He slandered your wife, ABC, he's done. 
You still want to pray janazah over him? Prophet ﷺ said, move away from me, O Umar. And he prayed the janazah over that man. Later on, Allah sent down revelation in accordance to the opinion of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. Ya Rasulullah, this is the maqam Ibrahim. Maybe we one should pray behind it. Revelation came down, pray behind the maqam Ibrahim, subhanallah. Similar to the matter of the prisoners after the battle of Badr. Ya Rasulullah, give me one of them. Ya Rasulullah, give that man another. Give this one that and let us finish them off these are major major criminals let us not ransom them no ransom let us finish them off later on revelation came down in accordance with the opinion of umar ibn al-khattab this was a man who left his home with his sword to take the life of the rasul he wanted to kill the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam subhanallah end of the day he's a believer in la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah what we pull out from that never judge a book by its cover Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, we moved on and we discussed the importance of this hadith in Namal A'malu bin Niyat. Ibn Hajar al Asqalani states, Tawatar al Nakal anil a'imma fi ta'zim had al hadith, that the scholars are unanimous with regards to the super important uh, position of this hadith. Had al hadith ahad al ahadith al Yadur ad Din alayha. The religion revolves around this hadith and other super important hadith like this. Imam Shafi'i said it enters into 70 chapters of fiqh. Came along the great Shafi'i scholar Imam Asyuti. What did he do? He listed 70 chapters that this hadith enters into. We've discussed this, brothers and sisters, walhamdulillah. And the audio has been uploaded onto Muslim Central Audio, so you can find it on the net. Bi'ithnillahi, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. We went on to the discussion pertaining to the importance of intention and its power over action and statement. That intention is more powerful than statement and action. I repeat, intention is more powerful than statement and action. And we listed about five or six reasons for this. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Niyatul mu'min khair min amalihi. The intention of the believer is better than his actions. Reported by Imam al-Bihaqi, although has some weakness in it. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out with the Sahaba, out in battle, expedition. Some Sahaba, they had valid excuses and they were unable to join. They remained behind in Medina. During the journey, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna aqwaman bil Medina, that they are a group of people in Medina al-Munawwara. Mas salakna shi'ba, we have not passed any, you know, valley, any area. Wala wadiyan illa wahum, except that for them, they also have an ajr. They also have the same reward as we getting. Subhanallah, they they in Medina in their homes. And you telling us, Ya Rasulullah, they're getting reward like us out in battle? Yes, why? Habasahum al Udur. They had a valid excuse. They wanted to come. They had the intention. They had the resolve. They had the determination. They wanted to be here. But they had a valid excuse. They will get the reward, subhanallah. Reward based upon what? Based upon their intention, brothers and sisters. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. Action and statement. Statement of your tongue, action of your limbs, follows what? Follows your heart, follows your intention in reward and in sin. Sometimes you can do one act, two rakahs of salah, and you can have multiple intentions. This is, for example, my tahiyyatul masjid. Plus, it's my two rakahs sunnah of salatul fajr. Plus, it's my two rakahs after performing my wudu. MashaAllah. Multiple intentions, multiple reward. MashaAllah. You are maximizing. You're sitting in the masjid. What's your intention, brother? This is my i'tikaf. Plus, I'm waiting for salah. MashaAllah. Plus, I'm going to recite some of the Quran. I'm going to make some dhikr. Plus, I'm sitting in the masjid because I want to stay away from sin. SubhanAllah. Multiple intention, greater your reward, maximize. The disbeliever will remain in the hellfire for eternity, some might say. He's only sinned for 50 years, 60 years. Why are you, O oh Allah, punishing him for eternity? Subhanallah. The ulama state because of intention. Because while he was on earth, his intention was, his intention was to continue upon his kufr for eternity. 
He had no intention after five years, I'm going to change. After 10 years, I'm going to change. Subhanallah. So punishment for eternity because he had the intention to continue upon that wrong for eternity. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amit Allah, before a short ad break, we discussed the books that scholars have put together where they began their book with this hadith. Example, Sahih al-Bukhari. Example, Umdatul Ahkam. Imam al-Suyuti's Jami al-Saghir. Imam al-Nawi's 40 Ahadith. His Riyadh al-Saliheen. His Majmu'. All of them. The first matter, the first page you will find. The Hadith. Innama al-A'malu bin niyat And it's so important that in some narrations, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this Hadith where? In the Masjid? While sitting down in some halaqa somewhere? No. But rather he mentioned it from the Mimbar. Because it's a cornerstone of our religion everything you do you're listening to this program right now what's your intention your intention will maximize your rewards brothers and sisters your intention should be that number one i want to earn reward from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number two i want to remove ignorance from myself number three i want to increase in my knowledge why because the rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever seeks a path of knowledge allah will make his part to paradise easy and number four you can add in that during this time instead of me falling into some sin bag biting riba namima talking about this one wasting my time on social media then rather i'm spending it in something good walhamdulillah ya abdullah ya amat allah we take a short ad break and when we return we continue assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Your brother in Islam Bilal Ismail of the Al-Kawthar Institute and Imam Development Project. Hayyakumullah. We continue bi idhnillahi ta'ala our topic of discussion. The 40 ahadith of Imam an nawawi rahimahullah and our current discussion, the first hadith. Which hadith? The hadith of innama al-a'malu bin niyat. And tonight is our second lesson in the explanation of this hadith, subhanallah. And most likely, we will not conclude the explanation of that hadith tonight. Subhanallah, it's an ocean of knowledge, this hadith. It's a cornerstone of the deen, brothers and sisters. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, not forgetting that there's 500 rands up for grabs, bi ta'ala, for the one who memorizes the 42 ahadith, insha'Allah. Brothers and sisters, we move on. Uh, individual works that have been put together related to this hadith we discussed in our previous majlis. You have Ikhlas wa Niyya by Ibn Abi Dunya. You have Maqasid al-Mukallafin by Umar al-Ashqar. You have an Niyya wa Atharuha fil Ahkam al shariya by Salih al-Sadlan. You also have Shar Hadith Innamal al-A'malu bin Niyat by Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Al-Umniyya fi Idraq al Niyya by Imam al-Qurafi. So you have many scholars, past, present, classical, who've put together books only discussing this one hadith. Subhanallah. The entire book related to this hadith, 100% yes. Moving on, we discussed, was there a reason behind this hadith? Did the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam mention this hadith for any specific reason? We find that there is a story with regards to somebody by the name of Muhajir Um Qais. The immigrant, the one who migrated for the sake of Um Qais. He wanted to get married to this woman by the name of Um Qais. So she said, I'll not get married to you unless you migrate to Medina al Munawwara. Sahaba were migrating from Mecca to Medina. But this man also joined in and he migrated, but not for the sake of Allah. But rather to get married to this woman. Is that something haram? Not haram at all. No problem at all. But in comparison to somebody who migrated for the sake of Allah, obviously your intention is on a different level, is on a lower level. So this narration that this man migrated to get married to this woman, this is 100% true. This is reported in the Sunan of Sa'id ibn Mansur and Imam al-Tabarani, etc. But its relationship to this hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ has not been established. There's this individual who migrated to get married to this woman, happened it's true but that incident is it related to this hadith innama al-a'malu bin niyat did our rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam mention innama al-a'malu bin niyat because of that man and he migrated to get married to the woman no 
that has not been established, Jaid, as Ibn Rajab al Hambali rahimahullah mentions in his in his Jami Ulum wal Hikam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We now move on bi ithnillahi ta'ala, we open up our discussion, we move on to the actual words of this hadith, insha'Allah. It begins innama, innama adatu hasr, innama establishes what is mentioned and negates everything else. If we say innama, for example, he is standing, it negates him being sitting, it negates him sleeping, it negates everything else, he is only standing, that's all. It affirms the mentioned and it negates all else, exclusive, this. Innama al-a'mal, verily actions, Verily actions, actions of what? Actions of the limbs, of your hands, of your eyes, of your nose, of your mouth, of your ears, actions of your feet, actions of the limbs, and actions of the heart, your hasad, your jealousy, your kindness, your rahmah, actions of the heart, Jayid, all types of actions. Innam al-a'mal, all types of actions, Jayid. Innam al-a'mal bin-niyat, they are, Caused by intentions. That's one interpretation. All actions are caused by intentions. Could also be all actions are accompanied by intentions. All actions are caused by intention. You need to have an intention. I wanted to pick up the pen. And so I had the intention in my heart. I was conscious of what I was doing. And so then I picked up the pen. Then it sent, you know, the message to the hands, pick up the pen, and the hand picked up the pen. I wanted to go to Durban. I was conscious of my intent. I wanted to go to Durban. Jumped onto the bus and you drove, you went to Durban. MashaAllah. So, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى And everybody will get whatever they intended. You intended good, you'll get good. Intended evil, you get evil. Intended nothing, you get nothing. SubhanAllah. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Whoever migrated for Allah and the Rasul, then he'll get Allah and the Rasul, subhanAllah. And وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا He migrated for the dunya, to get married to somebody, to do some business, for education, whatever it might be, or to marry a woman, then whatever he migrated for, that's what he will get. Summary of this hadith, بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى in its meaning, that the yardstick, important, the yardstick, the litmus test for evaluating action in terms of good, in terms of whether it's evil, in terms of how much reward you're going to get, in terms of how much of sin you're going to get, in terms of whether this action is valid or invalid, the yardstick, the litmus test for all of this is what? Is the heart. The litmus test is what? It's the matter of intention. Brothers and sisters, can you understand our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said that inna fil jasadi mudgha idha salahat salah al jasadu kullu wa idha fasadat fasad al jasadu kullu ala wa hiya al qalb in the body there's a muscle piece of flesh if it's good everything else of the body will be good if it's corrupt the rest of the body is corrupt what is it ya rasulullah it's the matter of the heart super important subhanallah Super, super important, the matter of the heart. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, the yardstick, the litmus test for evaluating your action in terms of whether it's good, whether it's evil, whether you're going to get reward, whether you're going to get sin, whether it's a valid action, whether it's invalid. It's all dependent upon the matter of your intention, the matter of your heart. In other words, intention differentiates between whether it's sin, whether it's Reward, whether it's valid, whether it's invalid. That's one of, the, one of the differentiating factors. Other benefits of intention. For example, intention differentiates between ada and ibadah. Muslim, non-Muslim, kids, adults, they take a shower. They have a bath, mashaAllah. You could just take an ordinary shower. Or you could be taking a ghusl. SubhanAllah. Once an act of daily occurrence one's normal type of act of the human being and the other one's an act of worship subhanallah somebody for example is fasting why because it's an act of worship six days of shawal i want to sort them out fasting on monday thursday ramadan an act of worship primarily mashallah somebody else 
Muslim, might not be Muslim. It's fasting. Why? Because they want to lose weight. Fasting. Why? Because the doctor advised them that they should not eat for a few days. Subhanallah. What differentiates between both of them? What differentiates? It's the matter of intention. Subhanallah. Within that, intention differentiates between different types of ibadah. Somebody's praying for rakah salah. It could be fard for rakah salah. It could be sunnah for rakah salah. It could be qada for rakah salah. It could be ada, meaning he's praying on time. Subhanallah. Outwardly, it's all the same. What's the differentiating factor? It's the matter of intention. Somebody takes out a hundred rand and he gives two, he gives to the poor individual. This poor individual receiving the hundred rand, this could be, could be zakah, it could be for the sake of Allah, it could be sadaqah, it could be zakah, it could be non-zakah. What differentiates? It could be a loan. It could be a loan. I'm just lending you the money, subhanAllah. What different? Outwardly, when somebody looks, you took out 100 rand and you gave the man. But it could be a loan. It could be sadaqah. It could be zakah. What differentiates? How do we know what's what? It's the matter of intention, subhanAllah. Somebody migrates for Allah, like in this hadith. Somebody else migrates to get married to a woman. We don't know. It's only your heart. You know the matter of intention, subhanAllah. So in summary, the correctness of action is dependent upon intention. The correctness of action is dependent upon intention. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, a beautiful discussion. Where's the place of your intention? Where's, where's, where's the place of your intention? It's where? It's in your heart. It's where? It's in your heart, subhanAllah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, this mas'ala, this matter of intention, subhanAllah, it is the most easiest of matters. The most easiest of matters, but unfortunately you find in the masajid, in the madaris, you find people completely confused about the matter. Ajib, for example, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he hears an individual mentioning that, Oh Allah, I'm making hajj for your sake, Oh Allah this, Oh Allah that. All are making Umrah for your sake, etc., etc., etc. So he asks the guy, Are you informing Allah or are you informing yourself? He says, I'm not informing myself. I know what I'm doing. I'm conscious of my action. He says, Are you informing Allah? No, I am not informing Allah. Allah knew what I was going to do even before I knew what I was going to do. So Ibn Umar told him, Please be quiet. There's no need for this verbalization. I repeat, the scholars are unanimous that the place of intention is in the heart. Example, sometimes an individual, he is accustomed to verbalizing his intention. He comes to the masjid, it is Salatul Dhuhr. He says verbally on his tongue, I am praying for rakahs of Asr. Allahu Akbar, and he finishes his salah. But he knew in his heart it was Dhuhr Salah. Wallahi, he knew it was Dhuhr. He says, Sheikh, you know what, Mawlana, I made a major mistake. What happened, brother? Uh, I said on my tongue that it was Asr, but I knew in my heart that it was Zuhr. What's the status of my Salah? 100% his Salah is valid. We go by at the end of the day, the overriding factor, what was in your heart. What was in your heart? That's what counts at the end of the day. The munafiq, the hypocrite, was somebody who outwardly, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I love you, O Muhammad. We want to aid you. We are your friends and supporters. Outwardly talk is cheap. But rather it's the matter of the heart. What's in your heart? That was the important matter. So we say to the brother, Your salah, this was your salat al zuhr Don't worry about what you said on your tongue. What was in your heart is of most importance. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. So the scholars, Hanafi, Shafi'is, Malikis, Hanbalis, whoever else you want to add to the mix, they are all in agreement that the place of intention is in the heart and the heart is what overrides matters. Having said that, you have an issue with regards to verbalizing the intention. I know the heart, that's the place of my intention. But what about this verbalizing of the intention? Before I fast, I say, Wallah, inni asumu ghadan laka faghfirli, etc. Oh Allah, I'm going to fast for your sake. Oh Allah, right now I'm breaking my fast. Oh Allah, I'm making wudu now. Oh Allah, I'm making ghusl now. Oh Allah, I'm praying four rakahs of such and such salah. Praying behind this imam, uh, Ka'bati Sharifa, ila akhirihi, until the end. Do I have to verbalize my intention? The answer is absolutely not. I repeat, the answer is absolutely not. Do I have 
to verbalize my intention the answer is absolutely not and we know if what you verbalize contradicts what you had in your heart what you had in your heart is given preference so the verbalization where did this come from did our rasul muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam talk about it advise us no did abu bakr umar uthman ali hassan hussein did they mention this talk about this did they practice this no imam abu hanifa rahimahullah imam malik rahimahullah ibn uh, hanbal rahimahullah and others did they mention this talk about it Pract- no this is something which came later on in history maybe allah knows best maybe for example you know you had the madrasa you had uh, kids who had a lot of time on their hands and so you know the teacher says right come here learn this here this is uh, this is the intention for uh, you know intention for zuhr salah for raka such and such etc for the sunnah you must learn something and then some places you have to learn it in urdu etc and then you thought to yourself uh, oh, oh teacher what about the zulu kids you know what are they gonna do no no don't worry for them it's fine you know they can say it in zulu and stuff like this here so it was no doubt a bit confusing you know for the youngsters and it got tricky because during the test you know when they were doing the exam they tested you give me the intention for four rakahs of salatul fajr so you had to know your you know you had to know your intentions mashallah otherwise they were going to catch you out ya abdullah ya amat allah as was mentioned this is something that the scholars are unanimous is not required you start your salah with allahu akbar and nothing before that subhanallah that's how the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam began his salah the hanafis the shafi'is the malikis the hanbalis none of them say you have to verbalize anything yes there are some who say it's a good thing it's a nice thing it would remind you about what you are praying but ya abdullah ya amat allah Sometimes we find that this good thing, this nice reminder has caused a lot of problems. You find a brother who's got the whispers of shaitan, got the whispers of shaitan. He enters the masjid. Imam is about to finish Surah Al-Fatiha. This guy, Allahu Akbar. Oh, I, I think I forgot to say something. I think I forgot to mention four rakahs. And so he starts again, Allahu Akbar. Imam is ready to go into ruku. He says, I forgot to mention uh, Kaabat al-Sharifa. And then Allahu Akbar, Imam's finishing the ruku. And then this guy's got whispers of shaitan, whispers of shaitan. He said, no, I, I think I forgot to say, I'm following iqtidi to be had al-imam. Allahu Akbar, subhanallah, second rakah, third rakah. And this guy hasn't started his salah. So here now we have a problem. This is something which was invented, something which some felt was a nice thing, a good thing. But now it's causing problems. And when it starts to cause problems, then definitely it should be avoided. When it's not causing problems, then that's another mas'ala. Bi-ithnillahi ta'ala, we take a short ad break. And when we return, we continue. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We continue bi idhnillahi ta'ala, your brother in Islam Bilal Ismail of the Al Kawthar Institute and Imam Development Project. Hayyakumullah. Our current discussion, hadith number one from the book 40 A Hadith of Imam An Nawawi Rahimahullah. And brothers and sisters, before the ad break, our current discussion, the matter of intention. Where's the place of intention? It's in the heart. Scholars are unanimous with regards to this matter. The Hanafis, the Shafi'is, the Malikis, the Hanbalis, across the board, everyone agrees the matter of intention is in your heart. But then they differ with regards to the matter of verbalizing the intention. Majority of the ulama, they state, that there's nothing special about any verbalizing of intention. In fact, as we learned, Ibn Umar, the man says, I'm making hajj for your sake, O oh Allah. Ibn Umar said, are you informing Allah? No, Allah already knew what I'm going to do. Are you informing yourself? No, I'm conscious, I know what I'm doing. So then keep quiet. You had one individual, he was in the haram. And he, he overhears the guy next to him, Allah, I'm praying behind this imam, following the Kaaba, uh, the four rakahs, this, that, etc. The guy turns to him and says, Brother, it seems all you left out was the date and time. You think Allah doesn't know where you are? You think Allah doesn't know what you're doing? Yes, you be conscious of what you are doing, but verbalizing it, who are you informing? Subhanallah. As, an indiv- as one of the ulama, he said, the one who verbalizes intention has a deficiency in their deen and has a deficiency in their, in their, in their dunya. Why? What do you mean, brother? This scholar, he said that deficiency in your deen because our Rasul did not tell us to verbalize intention. Sahaba did not verbalize intention. Nor the tabi'een, nor the great imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, etc. They never did this. 
So you're doing something that they never did. So you're coming with something they never did. You have a deficiency in your deen. Why do you say deficiency in my intellect? You have a deficiency in your intellect because before you pick up a pen, you do not say, oh Allah, I'm picking up the pen. Before you open up a book, you don't say, oh Allah, I'm opening up the book. You don't say, oh Allah, I'm not picking up this cup. You don't say, oh Allah, I'm starting my car. You don't say, oh Allah, I'm opening up the door. Why suddenly when you want to make wudu, ghusl, perform salah, now you have the sudden urge to inform Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was what one of the ulama had stated. And then as mentioned, some individuals, they have wiswas of shaitan. They have the whispers of shaitan. He says, Allahu Akbar. And then he says, no, I think I haven't said it. And so he comes back. Subhanallah, something that was brought forward that the sahaba, etc. never did. Now it's causing problems. So best that it be avoided. Someone might counter and say, brother, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, this is a good thing. It reminds me, uh, you know, to conscientize myself before the salah. So it's just a reminder. Understood, brother, with you, well, 100%. But subhanAllah, do you not agree that many a times we verbalize the intention and our mind is still absent with regards to what we're praying? We said, I'm praying four rakahs of zuhr and we said, Allahu Akbar. By the time your third rakah, you think to yourself, what am I praying? What am I praying? I've completely forgotten. So that means then that verbal intention which you claimed was to remind you about what you're praying hasn't really done its job. Maybe that verbal intention requires another verbal intention to remind it with regards to what you're praying. And later on, when that also goes on co-pilot and it becomes automated, we might require a verbal intention for the verbal intention for the verbal intention for the salah. Subhanallah, where are we going to go, brother? Just conscientize yourself with regards to what you are praying. When, for example, you wake up in the morning and you stand on your musalla. If somebody asks you, brother, what are you doing? Why are you standing on the musalla? You say, brother, I'm praying my two rakah sunnah of fajr. The fact that you are conscious, the fact that you know what you are doing, every conscious, intentional act that a rational person performs is driven and brought into being by his intention. Yes or no? Every conscious, intentional act that a rational person performs is driven and brought into being by his intention. Without the intention, there wouldn't be that act unless it was some accident, subhanAllah. If somebody said to you, brother, I want you to pick up the pen in front of you without intending to pick up the pen, that's impossible. How can I rationally, how can I consciously, intentionally pick up the pen without having the intention to pick it up? That's impossible. That's asking me to have an accident, pick up the pen by accident, subhanAllah. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah, also subhanAllah. As was mentioned, if somebody verbalizes the intention and he make, made a mistake, he messed things up, we say that what you had in your heart at the end of the day is given preference. So if that is the case at the end of the day, then what's the point in any verbal matter? Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, he mentions that if somebody just says something on their tongue, doesn't mean that they have sincerity in their heart. Somebody says, oh Allah, I am fasting for your sake. Does that mean they have ikhlas? Does that mean that they're truly doing it for the sake of Allah? No, subhanallah. He said, Imam Ghazali's words, in reality, you call that talking to yourself. Oh Allah, I am fasting sincerely for your sake. Does that mean I have ikhlas? No, it means I'm talking to myself. Allah musta'an. Ya Abdullah, ya amat Allah. This was with regards to the place of intention, it's in the heart. And we touched upon the mas'ala of verbalizing the intention. And if somebody feels they still want to do this, they cannot begin their salah without saying it. They are unable to begin the salah without verbalizing. Khair and barakah. Otherwise, is it something that is required? Is it something that I have to do? Absolutely not. We move on bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. When we talk about intention, brothers and sisters, there's... Two discussions we have to have. The first discussion, intention in terms of who are you doing this act for? Are you doing it for Allah? Are you doing it with ikhlas? Or are you doing it for show? Are you doing it for others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The intention discussion in terms of riya, in terms of showing off, and in terms of ikhlas. Ya Abdullah, ya amat Allah. Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an. When he heard the following hadith, he cried. Muawiyah 
cried. Which hadith? The first hadith in Sahih, the, which hadith? The famous hadith rather, the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim. With regards to the first three who enter into the hellfire, who would they be? Number one, the scholar, the alim. Number two, the one who gave millions in charity. And number three, the mujahid. But subhanallah, all these individuals outwardly did fantastic acts of worship. But there was one thing lacking. And that was the matter of ikhlas. That was the matter of intention. Their intention was not purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their intention in reality was to show was to show others. Others would hear about them, hear about how famous they are, hear about their qira'ah, hear about their recitation, etc., etc. And Allah would ask this scholar, what have you done? It's a frightening hadith, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. For the accountant, for the lawyer, for the businessman, it's not that frightening. You can seek the knowledge of business, you can seek the knowledge of law and the knowledge of handasa, engineering, etc. Solely to become rich, solely to become rich and famous, no problem, no problem. But the one who seeks the deen for the dunya, now that is a problem. Seeking the dunya for the dunya, no problem. Seeking the deen for the dunya, now that's a problem. And so this alim, Allah would ask, what have you done? Oh Allah, I sought your knowledge and I spread your knowledge and I thought here and I gave a lecture there and I did this and I wrote this book and I did... No, you only did so, so people would say, what a brilliant scholar, what a dynamic scholar, etc. And they said so in this dunya. You did it for the dunya. You got the dunya. They said so. They called you alama, they called you hazrat, they called you this, they called you that. You got your reward in this dunya. No share in the hereafter. Subhanallah. His magnitude of deeds were made minuscule because of the corrupt intention. Subhanallah. And on the opposite, brothers and sisters, the female prostitute from Banu Israel, she had some mercy for that dog and she gave some water to the dog and she entered into paradise. Her tiny act with a beautiful intention earned her paradise. And here, fantastic beautiful act so much of knowledge and books but the intention was corrupt it is zero Allah Musta'an. the second what have you done oh Allah, I spread your knowledge oh Allah I gave charity wherever they needed I spent in your sake no you only did so so people would say what a charitable man and they said so no share in the hereafter subhanallah and the third the mujahid what did you do? You fought? No. You only fought so people would say what a brave man, what a courageous man. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, do not underestimate the power of what people say. I repeat, do not underestimate the power of what people say. People do, people struggle, people strive, people spend, people take loans because of what people would say. And this Mujahid, he died on the battlefield. So that after his death, people would talk about him. People would mention how brave he He's not going to be around to even hear about that. He's not going to be around to enjoy. Oh, mashallah, they're talking about me. He's dead. He's long gone. But look at the power, subhanallah, the power of what people would say. That he's willing to give his life so that people would say such and such about him. Inna lillah wa inna wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And then Allah would order the angels to fling these three into the hellfire. Why? Because of the corrupt intention. Hadith in Sahih Muslim. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. When it comes to the matter, ikhlas and riya, you have your nafs. You also have shaitan. They want to corrupt that intention. We talk about in the noble Quran, amal as-salih. Amal as-salih means that it must be done for the sake of Allah primarily. Number two, it must be done in accordance to the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If either one of these pillars are missing, then it falls down. Ya Abdullah, ya Amat Allah. With regards to the matter of riya, with regards to the matter of showing off, with regards to the matter of insincerity, if there's an individual, he completely prays to show people, completely makes hajj and umrah just for show, nothing else, completely just for show. In reality, this here, you cannot uh, you know, get such an act from somebody who has a speck of iman. This individual had to be a munafiq. 
had to be a hypocrite. Outwardly, he's showing that he's a believer, but inside, completely corrupt. This is like that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul during the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those munafiqeen, they would stay away from Salatul Fajr, stay away from Salatul Isha. Why? Because it's dark in the masjid. People would not notice that they're not present, but they come for Zuhur, Allah, he's in the front of Asr, Allah, he's there, Takbir, Allahu Akbar. Masha Allah to put on a show. That's the munafiq. May Allah save us from hypocrisy. Signs of hypocrisy on a minor level that when you speak, you lie. When you give a promise, you break that promise. When people trust you with something, you break the trust. And on a side note, brothers, as per the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-majalisu bil-amana. When we meet, when I meet with Salim and I talk to him about something, I don't need to say to Salim, Brother Salim, keep this between us. Don't mention this to anybody else. By default, it's supposed to be between us. The majalis, our sitting, our discussion, it's an amana. I spoke to Brother Ahmed. I don't need to say to him, Brother Ahmed, please do not talk to anybody else about this matter. By default, it's between us. If he wants to mention to another, he needs to seek permission from me. Brother Bilal, you know, we spoke about this matter. Can I mention it to my wife? Can I mention it to my cousin? Subhanallah, look at how our defaults have changed. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So with regards to riya, the one who has complete riya, that's the munafiq, that we cannot expect such from a believer. Number two, what if, for example, somebody begins, Jayid, uh, he begins an action, you know, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but primarily it's for Allah. But from the beginning of his act until the end of his act, he wanted to put on a show. So he comes to the masjid, mashallah. He came to the masjid to pray Zuhr salah. But he proposed to Sumeya's father. And Sumeya's father is praying next to him. Right? And so he's making the sunnah salah, mashallah, prolonging it, his takbir and this and that, etc. From the beginning until the end, it was a show. You think Allah is going to accept that? You think that's valid before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? From the beginning until the end, it was for Sumayyah's father. It was not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jair. So that there is rejected and thrown back at that person. Allah states, he is the one most independent of any type of shirk. And whoever does shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will return back that shirk to him and for whoever it was done. Third category. Somebody, for example, you know, he started off this act for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the middle of it, you know, there was uh, some riya. So he's in the middle of his salah and Sumiya's father walked in. And so, you know, that, that raka, the third raka, he prolonged it. You know, mashallah, he's looking at me, etc. Prolonged the third raka. And the fourth raka, he says, no, no, this is wrong. You know, I can't put on a show. Let me just, you know, have my ikhlas. He fought against that nafs and fought against that shaitan. His salah is fine bi iznillahi ta'ala. His salah is fine bi iznillahi ta'ala. But what if he began his salah for Allah? Second rakah, Sumiya's father walks in and then he puts on a show until the end of the salah. Subhanallah. And then the scholars divide this matter into acts of worship where the end is linked to the beginning. Like for example, salah. The end of the salah is linked up to the beginning. It's one salah. So many of them say the salah is rejected. This is Sumayyah's father's salah. This is not salah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As opposed to somebody is giving charity. So he gave a hundred rands for the sake of Allah. He gave another hundred for the sake of Allah. Somebody else came for the sake of Allah. And then Sumayyah's father is watching. He took out another three hundred rands and he gave it there. You know, so mashallah, you know, this guy, son, new son-in-law, he's going to be a good guy, etc. So that three hundred rand there, was not given with ikhlas. As for the previous hundreds, with ikhlas. So those ones are for Allah. The 300 there, you know, not for the sake of Allah. And then Sumiya's father says, MashaAllah, he walks away. And then the guy gives another 50, 50, 50. That was for the sake of Allah. So that which, we, which was for the sake of Allah, will reach Allah. That which was for the sake of Sumiya's father, then that's another story, Allah Musta'in. So the scholars divide the matter into acts of worship where the end is linked to the beginning. If it's linked, it's rejected. If each one is like separate, like for example, you're teaching, so I taught you this page of the Quran, maybe I was putting on a show, you know, to show you, mashallah, how smart I am. The other four pages I taught you with ikhlas, then those ones I accepted from me and not this one here. As for, I didn't act for the sake of Allah, completely for the sake of Allah, walhamdulillah, 
after that people began praising me oh masha allah you were this and you were that and this and that and all of these things and then ala kulli hal if you were expecting that praise if you're waiting for the praise, then there's a mushkila, then there's a problem. But if this was not something expected, you did it for the sake of Allah, you fought mashallah in battle, and then the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa spoke well of you, you did such, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa praised Abu Bakr and Umar and others, etc. Then this here is glad tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bushra ajil al mu'min. This is glad tidings which came early for you, inshallah. Don't worry about that. Walhamdulillah. The last matter when it comes to ikhlas and riya and, 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 and Mixing up matters, multiple intentions. Somebody goes out in jihad, fi sabilillah, to raise the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah for the sake of Allah. He went out to fight, but he's also got uh, a secondary intention that I want to get some war booty. I want to get some war booty. Maybe, for example, you know, I uh, uh, get some, uh, you know, some armaments. I get this, I get that, etc. Maybe I get rich. His primary intention for the sake of Allah and he's got other secondary intentions, that's fine. No problem at all. No problem at all. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. When for example, somebody is memorizing Quran for the sake of Allah. Also, for example, you know, he uh, wants to be, increase his memory because those who memorize Quran have a better memory. And he wants the memorization of Quran to help him with his secular studies, fantastic, no problem. Primary intention for the sake of Allah, secondary intentions, no problem at all, alhamdulillah. Somebody gets married, you know, he wants to follow the sunnah, fantastic. Also, he wants to satisfy his desires, brilliant. He wants to have a kid, mashallah. More intentions, more the merrier, alhamdulillah. Primary intention, you know, with regards to his fasting, she wants to lose weight. She's fasting for the sake of Allah and secondary intention to lose some weight. He's going for Hajj. He also wants to get in shape. And so he's doing the Hajj for the sake of Allah. Secondary intentions, you know, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to get fit. Alhamdulillah. Fantastic. But there's a difference in terms of reward between the one who did it completely for the sake of Allah alone. Jihad for the sake of Allah. That's all. And the one who did it primarily for the sake of Allah with other secondary intentions. So his, his reward is obviously on a lower level. The one who fasted for the sake of Allah, nothing but that. His reward is much higher than the one who fasted so that they could lose some weight, so that they could better their health. They've got secondary intentions. Their reward is slightly lesser than the one who had complete ikhlas for the sake of Allah. Walhamdulillah. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah. So we discussed the matter of riya. We discussed the matter of the ikhlas. We spoke about the munafiq, complete riya from beginning until end. We discussed the one who, for example, has multiple intentions. As long as primary intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have secondary valid intentions, then it's fine insha'Allah. Last mas'ala, last matter before we end tonight's program and time flies, subhanAllah. Tark, leaving something. Am I automatically rewarded for leaving something? For example, Salim, he says, MashaAllah, today, you know what, uh, I've been a good Muslim. Why, Brother Salim? What did you do? He says, no, forget about what I did. I did not uh, gamble. I did not commit zina. I did not kill anybody. I did not swear my mother. I did not hit my father. You know, I, I, I didn't do all of these things. Uh, will I not be rewarded for this? We say, SubhanAllah, there's a difference between Tark leaving something and kaf jayid being tempted to do something and then you intentionally stay away from it for tark leaving something something which never crossed your mind mashallah you didn't do drugs well it never crossed your mind you were never tempted by taking drugs smoking mashallah you've never smoked your entire life but you were not tempted by it so you will not be rewarded for that but the one who for example he was tempted he really wanted to doors were open he wanted to go commit zina but he stayed away. Intentionally, he made the jihad and stayed away. You will be rewarded. Somebody was tempted to take out this uh, riba loan, buy another car, buy another home, etc. Whatever it might be. You know, he was tempted. It was there. They sent him a message. You can open up and get another 500,000 in your loan there. He was tempted. He said, no, no, this is not, I, I, cannot, I cannot involve myself in this state, away from it, consciously, now you'll be rewarded. But as for those matters, which never crossed your mind, it never crossed your mind with regards to stealing a Mercedes-Benz or BMW, you will not be rewarded for that. But if you were tempted, 
you saw it there and you saw the keys were there and the guy dropped the key as he was walking away. You were tempted. You said, no, I fear Allah. I cannot do this. This is not me. And you stayed away from it, then you will be rewarded. So, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, staying away from something which never crossed your mind, etc. In reality, there's no reward. But if you made kaf, you intentionally avoided, stayed away from the, it tempted you and you said no, then you will be rewarded for that. Alhamdulillah. And on that note, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, we come to the end of our tonight's discussion. Bismillahi ta'ala, we will continue our discussion related to this first hadith. And inshallah, we will try to conclude our discussion next week. Bismillahi ta'ala, as was mentioned, the audios are available on MuslimCentralAudio.com. Hayyakumullah, your brother in Islam, Bilal Islam. Ismail of the Al-Kawthar Institute and Imam Development Project until we meet again hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh